insightful podcasts by informative hosts. Insights into Things, a podcast network. Welcome to Insights into Entertainment, a podcast series taking a deeper look into entertainment and media. Your hosts, Joseph and Michelle Whalen, a husband and wife team of pop culture fanatics, are exploring all things from music and movies to television and fandom. Welcome to Insights into Entertainment. This is episode 40, Vampires, Zombies, and More. I'm your host, Joseph Whalen, and my thoughtful and provocative co-host, Michelle Whalen. Hi, everyone. I'm running out of description, <laughs> descriptors for you I here. Need, really. I need to get you a thesaurus. I need like a great big book of adjectives or something. <laughs> nice. Um, so, all right. We are here post-Halloween uh, episode, and we're talking vampires and zombies. Because vampires and zombies are all year long. Okay. Fair Duh. enough. Fair enough. Can't argue with that. <laughs> So today on our Disney Detective, we are going to talk about why Disney keeps hiding Hayden Christensen. We will talk about Anthony Daniels encouraging folks to rewatch uh, the original Star Wars before the rise of Skywalker. Then we have some solo news, and it's not that he wants to be a pilot, although <laughs> that is late breaking news. <laughs> is it? Is it really late breaking? <laughs> not really. No, I didn't think so. Uh, then in our entertainment news, we have uh, the Dracula trailer um, we'll be taking a look at and, and talking about. Uh, the Walking Dead, some of the Walking Dead stars are swearing off of a few conventions here due to some unpleasantness they experienced. And uh, Norman Reedus of Walking Dead reflects on his run on the show. Mm-hmm. Uh, so pretty good show today, and then we'll finish up with our insightful picks of the week. And I think we're ready to go. Let's do it. All right. Go for Disney Detectives. So really, our Disney Detectives segment is really Disney Star Wars Detectives. Cause Nothing wrong with that. Oh. We, we throw enough love <laughs> Disney's way. Exactly. So all of our, our stories today uh, are related around the Star Wars theme. Um, so Star Wars, you know, Disney kind of keeps hiding Hayden Christensen. Um, so apparently he was uh, visiting Star Wars Galaxy's Edge um, and, you know, taking in the sights like many actors and, and celebrities before him. Um, but you kind of didn't know about it because they had tweeted about it with pictures of him. And then all of a sudden they took it down. Now they did actually put it back up, but what was kind of funny was there wasn't anything crazy about the images. You saw him with some pose shots with some fans inside uh, the millennium Falcon. So, you know, why is it that they're, they're hiding him? Um, and what's kind of funny is this isn't the first time that he's run into an incident where, you know, he kind of wasn't allowed to be around, I guess. Right. Um, so what had happened was he had appeared at Celebration. He was doing autographs and signings and stuff. And then he was supposed to be doing a panel with um, Ian Mc... McDermott. McDermott, uh, who the plays Emperor. the Emperor. Um, and right before the panel was supposed to begin, it got canceled. And nobody really even knows why it got canceled. You know, some of the speculation was something, you know, that Disney kind of came in and said no. So, you know, some people are kind of wondering, you know, why are they <laughs> kind of keeping him away, you know, from everything. Right. Um, the person that actually wrote this article, which was on... <laughs> The, the dork side of the, the force.com um, said, you know, that he was hoping that maybe it was because he's going to actually have some sort of cameo in the last Star Wars movie. There's, maybe, there are rumors, you know, about yeah. him being Ghost Vader type, 
Well, you know, it's not like we can bring Sebastian <clears throat> Shaw back for that. They already did did away with the right. They got rid of that whole aspect, yeah. you know, of it. So, you know, they were thinking, oh, maybe it has something to do with that. That, you know, he was going to spill the beans on it or something. I don't know. But yeah. what was he doing in Galaxy's Edge? He was just visiting. He was. <laughs> He was making a lightsaber. Boy, I'll bet that cost him an arm and a leg. <laughs> that was that was a setup, yeah. That was almost the name of the podcast today. <laughs> That's why we had to have the story just just for that. Yeah, I couldn't I couldn't help myself on that one. Actually it would have been an arm and two legs, right? Yeah, an arm and two legs. Just one arm? Well yeah, because the other one got cut off by oh, Dooku. Right, right. So that one was already yeah, cut off. That's so. right. He was waiting anyway, all week for that, I, everyone. I, I couldn't resist that one. Yeah, so we'll we'll see. Um, you know, see what happens with it's that. Not, so. It's not, I mean, it's conceivable they're hiding him because of all the bad memories of Star Wars he tends to conjure up in the diehard fans, too. True, true. And the fact that he ruined one of the best villain characters in the history of cinema, too. Right. Oh, that and he can't act. He's a terrible actor. Um. Should I go on? I mean, it, it's entirely I, up to you. How, how much I, time I've got a got? list. I can pull the list out why you don't want Hayden Christensen <laughs> around this franchise anymore. Oh, goodness. So, anyway, Anthony Daniels has chimed uh, in. Tell us yeah, about that. Yeah, so there was a, a cute little uh, video that popped up where you get to see Anthony Daniels as C3PO basically encouraging fans to rewatch Star Wars before Rise of Skywalker. Um, so obviously everybody knows, you know, who, who was interested in watching, uh, uh, the last movie has it probably already on their, their, uh, you know, their calendar. They already bought their tickets. If you don't know, it's opening on December 20th. I know we've been talking about it for, for ages. Um, so Anthony Daniels is encouraging fans to get ready to see Rise of Skywalker by Rewatching all of the previous Star Wars movies before the new one hits theaters. Um, so when C-3PO talks, the heroes in the galaxy far, far away <laughs> don't always listen, but you'll do well to heed to Anthony Daniels here because he is speaking sense. Um, we're less than two months away now from Star Wars Rise of Skywalker, um, and if you start watching at least one per week, then you'll make it up to um, the the time frame when the new movie will come out. Or if you really wanted to do a, a marathon in one sitting, that's 27 hours and 21 minutes, in case you, you know, were, were counting. Um, and that's, you know, starting with episode one and, and going forward. Um, you know, now if you do want to include Rogue One and Solo, you could do that too. Because he wants to be a pilot. Because you know? <laughs> he wants to be a pilot. Um, but watching, you know, may be beneficial for seeing uh, The Rise of Skywalker because this is the final film of the 40 plus year journey. And obviously, there's, a, you know, we've talked about it before, uh, you know, various different things are going to kind of be wrapped up. You know, yeah. things that hadn't been, Hopefully. you know, discussed. So the idea And all is, that crap that Ryan Johnson put in last time will <coughs> be fixed, right? I right. So, you know, so it might be a good idea, you know, for those that, that want to. And then, obviously... So <coughs> is this really just a shameless plug to get is. people to subscribe to Disney Plus well, and watch and the movies? Well, and I was going to say, and that's the, the next part of it, is that, you know, for those, you know, that obviously Rise of Skywalker is, you know, kind of the end of the Skywalker saga... But there's obviously much more coming um, with Disney Plus. You have The Mandalorian uh, coming out. Some but other all the Star Wars movies are going to be available, right? On so all Plus. the Star Wars movies. So, so, so like, hey, you should go back and watch them all. Oh, and if you want to, you can subscribe to Disney <laughs> Plus and get them. Right. So it, it probably is, but you know. But then obviously you also have you know the new game coming out on April fifteenth, Star yeah. Wars Jedi Fallen Order, and. Um, you know, so there's obviously still more Star Wars stuff. That's the one with that... Joker, right? <laughs> the main character is played by the character who played Joker on Gotham. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, I didn't realize that. <laughs> See, look at that. That'll be kind of funny. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. So, go back, watch them all, do a marathon. Awesome. <clears throat> so, next up, we have someone besides me criticizing the movie <laughs> Solo. Let's hear about that. Right. So, Solo, a Star Wars story, was 
obviously, you know, has the distinction of being the first Star Wars movie not to take over the box office and become a global smash hit. And, you know, the movie did okay, but expectations for Star Wars movies are just so high, and Solo largely failed to meet them. And there's a lot of reasons that many, you know, believe that, you know, why it happened. But the screenwriter, uh, Lawrence uh, Cashdan, seems to have decided that many of the faults in the studio could be traced back to the studio. Um, in a recent appearance at the Austin Film Festival, the writer of Star Wars The Empire Strikes Back appeared to claim that his final entry into the galaxy, far, far away, uh, faltered because the problems of the studio level. Um, after helping out with the script on Star Wars The Force Awakens, he apparently only agreed to write Solo a Star Wars story if he could do it with his son Jonathan. Uh, it seemed that the father and son writers had no issues with the film, um, but then uh, Cash Den said that after the script left his hands, the problem ensued. And basically, in his words, he said, then the studio blew it, but that's not unusual. Um, he really didn't elaborate much to that, but it just seemed like they were issues because then you had the changeover of the Director, directors. Yep. Um, so it was Phil, um, Phil Lord and Christopher Miller were hired to direct it. And then halfway through, it was changed over to Ron Howard. And it was kind of reported that filming was just taking really long with the original two directors and that they're, they were allowing a lot of improv on set. So it was just making things things go, you know, longer. And then this also led to um, clashes between the directors and and Lawrence. And it seemed ultimately the decision at the studio, you know, they kind of sided with Lawrence. So then the directors got mad and they left and it just, you know, everything just kind of went downhill. Yeah. I mean, Kazan has a fantastic reputation Mm -hmm. in the Star Wars world, you know, just on his work with Empire. Right, just alone with that. Just alone with that. Yeah, yeah. Um, And it it didn't help them that they cast someone that that was not a convincing person. Right, you have that too. In the role of of Han Solo, you know. And I think, and that was the thing too, is like, he, for me, I think he was trying too hard to act like Harrison Ford, where... Well, the problem was he didn't. Like, he didn't walk like him. He didn't talk like him. He didn't have the swagger. He didn't have the attitude. Yeah. Oh, and he looked nothing he look like nothing him. Like, like him. Could, it was almost like Disney went out of their way to yeah. cast someone to to basically recast the part. Yeah. And you can't recast Harrison Ford as Han Solo. I'm yeah, sorry. and that's the thing is, but you couldn't get him to no play but, it either. But the technology exists that you can put another character in there and true. The face. And and now we've seen that you know in a number of movies you know since then that where they have done that where they have taken you know or what they should have done was have uh, Harrison Ford come in and basically make him make whoever the role person the role was an understudy. Mm. And coach him on how to be the character. Yeah, that probably would have would have worked too. Um, you know, but uh, I, from what this article was talking about, a lot of their issues came over because of the 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 additional costs from having to swap out the directors. Right. So. Well, and Disney is having serious problems with their directors because. Right. A lot of it has to do with the studio, mm-hmm. like Kazan says, is that Disney wants too much creative control because they have this standards body that they have right, by Right, right. One of them, you know, there's like three golden rules. I forget what the other two were, but the one was you can't show dismemberment. Like, you can't chop a limb off. Well, every Star Wars movie chops a limb off. Right, has somebody... So how do you do a Star Wars movie with those rules? Right, you know? yeah, yeah. So... So Solo is actually the lowest grossing live action Star Wars movie um, to date. Uh, original plans, obviously, we're seeing, you know, when Disney took over, you know, the whole Star Wars thing was that we were going to see a new movie every year. But obviously, that's kind of shifted when they realized well, how and poorly. You know when they announced those plans, mm-hmm. all the Star Wars fans knew it wasn't going to work. They were trying to take Star Wars and do what they did with Marvel. Right. And And with Marvel, it works because you've got four or five franchises that are building towards one climax 10 years later, and they did a fantastic job. Right, right. Star Wars isn't constructed like that. Right, right. So you, you, you're not driving this overall story, especially when you're trying to go back and rewrite yeah. the stories of the people that you had already. Mm-hmm. 
you know, you went back and you did Rogue One. Okay, that's not moving the story forward at all. No. You went no. back and did Solo. That's not moving the story forward at all. Right. You need to you know? go beyond. Right. 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 So, obviously, like I just said, you know, their plan was to do it every year. Now, after Rise of Skywalker, the franchise will actually take a couple years off before resuming with you know, the, 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 the other schedule, but obviously with Disney plus you'll have the Mandalorian and all the other little right. side projects and that's why, like, with that. So a solo series would have been fine. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Like they're doing with Obi-Wan, a six part yeah. series would have been perfect. You could yeah. have stretched the story out. And, and that was one of the things that killed the movie. Right. Itself, and, and like we said, they tried to mm -hmm. do too much in the hit. They tried to build this history. Right. That in a two hour period, when you were introduced to Han Solo in a new hope. He had this baggage that he brought with mm -hmm. him, him and Chewie. Right. And they tried to sh to basically cram all that baggage into a single piece of luggage mm -hmm. there, and it just didn't work. And it and it totally would have worked as, as a, a series. A six-part, even you a three-part series. Because you could have done skips <clears throat> in time frame mm -hmm. to explain how what happened in between before. Right. You could have done events. him as the teenager, which we kind of saw, and then you know, break away a couple years later to, right. to this and a couple Instead, years later to Instead, they have a this. story that in the movie, it occurs it looks over the like course a couple of a couple years. of days and they cram Well, every... a couple of years. Well, it is. The beginning of, part. Of, but I'm talking about his time with Chewie. Right, right. Like his time with Chewie is he built that entire relationship over a couple of days. Right. That's that's not believable under any circumstance. Right. It's not the right. kind of history that they mm -hmm. had. Yeah, yeah. So, anyway, I'm glad I'm not the only one that had a problem with that movie. <laughs> So I think that's it for Disney, Disney Star Detective. Wars detectives. Yes. There we go. All right, moving on. Tell us about Dracula. Blah blah blah. <laughs> I do not say blah, blah, blah. <laughs> um, so this had me a little excited because one, it's Dracula, and two, it's British. So <laughs> it don't take much, does it? So a new teaser trailer came out um, for Dracula, which will be um, on BBC One, but then coming to Netflix. Um, and so they had the first look at the reboot just in time for, for Halloween. It actually came out uh, a couple of days ago. Um, so uh, BBC has uh, lifted the coffin lid, ha ha ha, uh, on the That's new trailer. Clever, yeah, that was clever. Um, and it's in production with Netflix and also the makers of Sherlock, also oh, BBC, how uh, as well. So it's actually going to be a three part series, um, and it's written by Sherlock's uh, Mark uh, Gasson and Stephen Moffat. And produced by uh, Hartswood's uh, Films. Um, the series, which it just finished filming in August, uh, is obviously inspired by Bram Stoker's classic novel and will reintroduce the world to Dracula, the vampire who made evil sexy. Um, so it's set in Transylvania in 1897. Uh, the blood-sucking count is drawing his plans against Victorian London. And by judging by the trailer, the series will be full of gruesome nastiness uh, that will not be, <clears throat> excuse me, for the faint of heart. Uh, the trailer features blood splattered letters, a fly in an eyeball, loose fingernails, um, and a bang, whispering, menacing uh, to a terrified victim. Oh, bang, who's the, the actor that plays Dracula, saying, try and stay calm. You're doing very well. Yeah, it was very, like, ooh, creepy, you know, yeah. and, like, blood was dripping down. Well, you know, I you gotta know. say, I'm glad to see they're going back to kind of these traditional horror roots with it. Yeah, and yeah. And we're not getting... The Twilight the version. love story, and... yeah. I mean, now, come on, that's just... Yeah, this is this is the nice, gruesome Dracula of, of Days of Old. Yeah, I, want, I want rotting <laughs> flesh and blood sucking and, you know... Corpses and not, bodies all over not, the place. You know, 90210 for vampires. <laughs> So Dracula will air on BBC One in the UK and then Netflix around the world later on. So awesome. looking forward to that. So why are our friends from The Walking Dead pissed off? So we have a lot of celebrities from The Walking Dead that are actually swearing off Walker Stalker Con. Um, so The Walking Dead stars have actually now permanently pulled out of Walker Stalker Con, which is formerly the worldwide Walking Dead themed convention that recently 
recently announced that it would now be exclusive to Atlanta, Georgia after 2020. Um, and this was one that they kind of did kind of like how Wizards and, and Comic Con, you know, there's you, there used to be one in, regional you know, ones. regional ones. Because yeah. there used to be one up in, in North Jersey. Because there's Walking Dead fans outside of Atlanta, right? Right. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So a tweet published on Monday um, by one of the stars uh, said that it's time to shut this stuff stuff down. But he didn't say stuff. Um, confirming that basic uh, that stars Norman Reedus, uh, Deanna Guerrero, Melissa McBride, Cooper um, Andrews are not coming to the convention when it returns over Halloween weekend in 2020. So the exodus comes after days. Um, the exodus comes days after the Walker Stalker creator uh, resigned as CEO in the wake of a problematic issue that happened in Atlanta 2019, where the Walking Dead star uh, Angel Theory was reportedly verbally assaulted by a member of the convention's security staff. Now, who does Angel play? She's um, one of the deaf characters. Okay. And so reading through the article, basically all of the, the different celebrities, you know, said, I'm not coming, she's not coming, blah, blah, blah. And so it seemed that there was an issue um, because... One of the, like I said, the the convention staff uh, security member was verbally assaulting her because she had her service dog with her. Uh, the other problem, too, was that they didn't have a translator for her. Um, and I guess that was something that was supposed to be set up. So it was just a very difficult situation. And I guess there was also issues um, where some of the celebrities weren't getting paid for their time to really? to go. So a lot of people were like, you know, they said, while we always enjoyed going to these conventions, meeting our fans, you know, it, it costs us money to come out there. We're, you know, we're supposed to get, you know, paid for it. You know, just like, you know, if you went to something, you know... And oh, and it's not like the convention's not making money off the... Exactly, you know? exactly. So they, they basically pulled out from doing this type of convention, but they did say they would obviously, you know, do other, um, you know, other conventions, you know, or, around the, the world. It's just this specific one they were going to stop uh, supporting. Okay. That's unfortunate, but, mm -hmm. you know... It is what it is. Yeah, yeah. So Norman Reedus. So happier Walking Dead, uh, excuse me, uh, news. So he, um, so uh, Norman Reedus, who plays Daryl Dixon, uh, was on last week's episode of The Late Show with Stephen Colbert, and he was kind of discussing, you know, his character um, on from The Walking Dead. Um, Reedus has starred on The Walking Dead since the show debuted on AMC in 2010, and he has seen several characters come and go, including Glenn and Herschel and, and Rick. Um, so he said, like Norman and Daryl, I have the ghosts of these characters and these people that I've met that I started the show with. So as my characters progressed, I find myself, Norman, on set with, you know, you know, this on set behavior. Uh, he said, and Daryl is trying to make decisions like, what would Rick do? What do you think Hersha would do? So I sort of carry the weight of them um, with me, he said. Um, he even said that he kept Lincoln's beard, uh, Andrew Lincoln's beard, Wilson's ponytail, uh, Scott Wilson, who played Herschel, um, he, his, his fake ponytail from the set, and he actually stores them in his refrigerator. <laughs> <laughs> Which I thought was really weird. Um, he said Herschel's fake head and Daryl's crossbow are actually in the Smithsonian oh, wow. uh, in Washington. So I thought that was kind of interesting. He says his crossbow was right next to Rocky Balboa's gloves and his Italian stallion robe. Like, that has to be kind of cool to think... You know, your is memorabilia cool. is like that. Um, so The Walking Dead was actually renewed for 11th season this month ahead of the season 10 premiere. Uh, he's also involved with a new video game, uh, Death Stranded, um, where a new trailer was actually released showing his character journeying across you know, across the country mm -hmm. with, with various people. Um, he's actually one of only, what did we figure, three main characters that are, that are still, still yeah, from you know one. from season one um and 
he his character has actually always been one where you know fans had said the minute you get rid of Daryl that's it I'm done yeah um and obviously for those that you know have read the comics his character's not even you know in the comics so he, he was an addition to the show and totally you know makes it and it and it's so funny because you've actually gone back now yeah. and started watching. Walking Dead from from the beginning where I had watched it from the beginning, you know, obviously still watching it. And it's interesting to see that 10 year time crunch done so quickly and to see how his character really has grown. Oh, yeah. You know, yeah. in the beginning, he was this punk. He's and... still got that thousand yard stare, though. <laughs> he does. He just uh, <laughs> looks at I do you like what he stuff. said about, you know, Daryl's trying to make decisions like what would Rick do? And then do the opposite. <laughs> right. Because now that you've watched it, you realize. Rick makes all the wrong decisions. <laughs> Rick makes all the wrong decisions. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, he's actually one of my favorite characters mm -hmm. in the show. Yeah. Too. Just because yep. he has, he has, there is so much character there. Mm -hmm. And he really doesn't have to say a lot. No. You no. know, I, to. Like, he does a lot of, of, um, acting like so much comes through in his acting that the dialogue does not have to be overly robust and it's right. not for right for his character for, for yeah. daryl yeah so. yeah awesome so that's it for entertainment news that is it all right we'll be back with insightful picks Go, my dear, for your insightful pick. So my insightful pick is a new series that um, came out on Amazon Prime on October 18th, and it is called Modern Love. Um, it is a American romantic comedy anthology um, based on the weekly column that is published in the New York Times. Uh, it appeared, like I said, on October 18th. And actually, on October 24th, it was reported that Amazon had renewed uh, the series for a second season. Um, and it's a really cute love story-ish type thing, um, because what it is is it explores love in a multi-latitude of forms, including sexual, romantic, uh, f uh, f uh, f um, familia, uh, platonic and self love. How so, about love in an elevator? Does it explore that? No, there no. was no love in an elevator. Okay. Well, kind of, kind of, sort of. Well, Actually, there you go. The, cover, the, yeah, covering right. all the bases. Um, so it's interesting because it's it's an eight part series, um, and each episode is um, a standalone uh, for itself. Um, but what's kind of interesting is in the final episode, you kind of get to see past characters from. Uh, the other episodes um, in different time frames because like the first episode um, goes through like a six year <clears throat> period. So when the final episode shows, you kind of see just the beginning part of that one where one of the other episodes also goes through a couple year time span, uh, like a five year time span. And in the final episode, you you meet some of the characters and it's at the end of the time span. So you never really know where So are these some multiple of these, stories that are interacting or are they all standalone? They're all standalone in the individual in the individual episodes, but then in the final one they kind of do like an epilogue okay. type thing <clears throat> like you know the the final scene, you know, you see the one character kind of like taking a walk through the park and she passes by and you see the people that you met in the first episode. Then you end up seeing people you met in, you know, the second episode and then like the, the you know, the third episode, but it's different time spans. So, you know, for some people you saw them in the beginning, some people you saw them in the end and some people you saw them five years later. So it was kind of, you know, an interesting little way to kind of wrap it up in a cute little, you know, for some, uh, for for some in the epilogue, you got to see an ending that you didn't see in that original, you oh, know, okay. so it was like, oh, you thought maybe like these two got together <laughs> and now you see the epilogue and now this person's with somebody else. You're like, oh, yeah. OK. So it was, a, like I said, a cute little way to wrap it up. Each episode was like a half hour long. So, it, it, you know, it wasn't very long. It's all with a background of, of New York City. Everything, you know, takes place, uh, you know, in the, the city. Um, and again, nice little romancy you know, type show uh, if you're into that kind of thing. Cool. Nice pick. Thank you.
So my pick this week is a podcast that was actually suggested to me by my son, Sam. Uh, it is Dan Carlin's Hardcore History. Uh, Sam and I, my son, are both uh, history buffs. And uh, he had been listening to this one for a little while now and thought that I would like it. So uh, I, I picked it up recently, uh, subscribed to it, and started listening to it. Uh, so in Hardcore History, journalist and broadcaster Dan Carlin takes his Martian unorthodox way of thinking and applies it to the past. Was Alexander the Great as bad a person as Adolf Hitler? What would Apaches with modern weapons be like? Uh, will our modern civilization ever fall like civilizations from past eras? This isn't academic history, and Carlin isn't a historian, but the podcast's unique blend of high drama, masterful narr narration, and Twilight Zone-style twists has entertained millions of listeners. Um, the last episode that he has available is show 64, Supernova in the East, which he talked about the rise of uh, Japan prior to the U.S.'s involvement in the war and moving through the U.S.'s involvement after the bombing of Pearl Harbor. And what I find interesting about his style is he very eloquently draws parallels to, to an analogies more or less to other things to make you understand it. So, so one of the things that people tend to have happen in history, um, when you, when you're watching history podcasts or listening or, or you're listening to history lectures is you get bogged down in the minutia and you only get the facts and you're, you try to interpret those facts. And one of the things that's kind of interesting about this podcast is he'll draw an analogy. And the, and the one that really stuck with me was this last episode, supernova in the East, where he talked about the allies coming together. Um, Cause you figure by the time the United States comes in, the war is two years old at this point in time, it's been raging in the Pacific uh, Taiwan's fallen, uh, Australia's under attack. So you have all this aggression going on and, um, the British are having a difficult time supporting their colonies in the Pacific because they're dealing with the battle of Britain at the same time and they need an infusion of supplies. So, you know, I'm sure most people are familiar with the Lend-Lease Act where Roosevelt, you know, the United States was still in an isolationist mode before Pearl Harbor, and most of the Americans didn't want to get involved in the war in Europe. So Roosevelt did what he could to provide supplies and ammunition and tanks and so forth as part of a deal to the UK. And when the United States finally got involved, they got involved conditionally with the United States leading the efforts. And uh, it sat, it didn't sit well with a lot of the British and a lot of like, that doesn't come out. Like the only time you really see tension in the higher upper command was usually when it was against individual generals, you know, uh, Patton and, and Montgomery were a great example of that tension where they were constantly fighting against each other. Um, but the, the British people you know, very proud people. They were the largest empire in the world, largest Navy in the world. You know, it was, it was hard for them to take a back seat when the United States got involved. And he equates this to a startup company, you mm, know, okay. the British basically were a startup company. They're in the process of trying to, to get off the ground here and survive, but they're running out of resources. And the United States came in as that investment capital. Okay. You know, we'll fund you, we'll do this, we'll provide you with these resources, but we want to say in how it's spent and how it's done. And just the fact that he's able to put that analogy out there really puts the whole subject into perspective a lot differently. And that's a lot of what he does on the podcast itself. It's very plain spoken, um, uh, citing primary sources. You get a lot of quotes in there. So you, you almost feel like, you know, you're, you're, you're sitting in the middle of it Okay. Um, for a podcast. And, and there's not a lot of special effects. There's no, uh, you know, audio effects or anything. I mean, it's literally, he does this as a narrator with his voice and he does a fantastic job with it hmm. and, and certainly keeps my interest. 
Um, and I would highly recommend it. That is Dan Carlin's Hardcore History Podcast, available on Apple Podcasts and all major podcast distributions. Uh, and I think that is all that we had. It is. And uh, you can reach us. We'll go down our contacts. You can reach us on email at comments at insightsintothings.com. On Twitter at insights underscore things. On YouTube at youtube.com slash insights into things. On the web at www.insightsintothings.com. You can get our audio podcast at podcast.insightsintoentertainment.com. And finally on Facebook at facebook.com backslash insights into things podcast. And I think that's it. Another one in the books. Another one done. All right. We're out of here. Wow. <laughs>